The Conquer Worry Show, episode number eight. This show is not to be considered medical advice. The contents of the show are for informational purposes only. Nothing should be considered or used as a substitute for professional medical or mental health advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you are struggling, please seek professional medical assistance and call 911 if there is an emergency. Global hotlines can be found on conquerworry.org. Welcome to the Conquer Worry Show, the show dedicated to creating awareness of the resources that are available for those who struggle with worry, anxiety, or depression. If you are struggling now, if you have struggled in the past, or if someone you love is struggling, this is the show for you. Welcome to another episode of the Conquer Worry Show. I am your host, Jay Coulter. I am not a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a counselor, or a social worker. Just someone who has struggled with anxiety and depression in the past. And my team and I have dedicated ourselves to creating awareness of the resources that are out there for people who struggle. Today we have a great episode. We are going to interview Eric Aller a former Dale Carnegie trainer, and we're going to discuss what I believe is the greatest book ever written on conquering worry. And we're also going to interview Eric Zimmer over at the podcast One You Feed. Those guys are putting out some great material, interviewing folks that have overcome some personal struggles, and we want to make sure we highlight all the great work that they are doing over there. So, Chris Ellen, what do you think about this episode? This episode is really about a book that you and I have had in our lives for a long time. Yeah, we really have. We, You know, gosh, we've been giving this thing out. I've been giving it out since college. And obviously, we've been together almost 10 years. So you've probably been doing about the same. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Is there anybody you've given it out to that kind of stands out to you? I remember when you and I were first married, and I had a good friend that was going through a divorce. And we gave it to her. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it helped her? I do. I do. I mean, going through a divorce is very difficult, but I think it gave her some guidance. I also think that just the act of giving her a resource, I, think, I, I remember her being very grateful. She read it. She asked us some questions about it. Yeah. Do you remember the night she came over and was asking us um, things like how we would use the book and things that we had, how we incorporated it into our lives? Yeah, that's right. She came over with the book and a bottle of wine, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Two things to really help you get through a divorce. (laughs) So before we play the interview, I want to spotlight a podcast that I think our listeners would appreciate. The podcast is called The One You Feed. It can be found at oneufeed.net. You can find a link to it in the show notes to this episode. And I had an opportunity to interview Eric Zimmer, one of the hosts of the show, and he shed some light on the thought process behind their name, which is based upon an old parable, and why they are doing the episodes and why they created this podcast. And hey, Chris, you had a chance to listen to a couple of the episodes, dude. You have any thoughts? Yeah, their podcasts are really interesting. They do a lot of interviews, which are really good. They even did one recently with Dave Davies of the Kinks that I found really, really interesting. Yeah, and you and I are old enough to have appreciated the Kinks. Yep. (laughs) All right, I'm going to play an interview now with Eric Zimmer. I would like to introduce our listeners to Eric Zimmer. Eric hosts a podcast called The One You Feed, which can be found at oneufeed.net, O-N-E-Y-O-U-F-E-E-D dot net. On his website, they describe the show as it takes a conscious and constant creative effort to make a life worth living. This podcast is about how other people keep themselves moving in the right direction 
how they feed their good wolf. Eric, welcome to the Conquer Warrior Show. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, of course. I, I love your podcast. Could you, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started it and why you started it? Sure. Well, the podcast is called The One You Feed, and it's based on something that's called The Parable of the Two Wolves. And it's an old story. Its origins are unknown. Um, but it, it, it goes something like this. There's a, there's a grandfather, and he's talking with his grandson, and he says, in life, there are two wolves inside of us who are always at battle with each other. One is a good wolf, which represents things like kindness and bravery and love. And the other is a bad wolf, which represents things like hatred and greed and fear. And the grandson stops and he thinks and he looks at his grandfather and he says, well, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. So our show is, it's an interview format show where we interview people that I am, that we're interested in about how they feed their good wolf. What are the things that they do in life that make them successful? And we've got, we've had musicians, we've had authors, we've had Buddhist teachers, we've had a variety of different people. So what that means to each of them is slightly different, but that's the, that's the context of the show. And, and I, I started it really with two two main goals and the first was to remind myself to feed my own good wolf on a regular basis because i i can tend to drift into depression or negative thinking to a certain degree if i'm not if i'm not reminding myself and then the second was i just wanted to spend more time with my best friend who's who's my uh partner on the show so that's why we started it and what it's about okay okay and and what's his name Chris. Okay. Well, why don't you give us an example of one of the interviews that you've had here recently? Sure. We, um, we've had, you know, I'll just list off a couple people we've had, and then we'll talk about maybe one of them in more detail, but we've had Dave Davies of the kinks on recently. We've had, uh, Brian Koppelman. He's a Hollywood screenwriter. We've had a couple different, um, some more musicians, Mike Scott of the water boys, but and a guy named Todd Henry, who's a, who's another online president. He run, presence. He runs something called the Accidental Creative. But one that I want to talk about first is a gentleman named Randy Scott Hyde. And Randy Scott Hyde is a uh, he's a professional fundraiser who lives in San Francisco, and he really had fallen into a lot of depression over the years and was was really struggling. And he read something by a guy named Sean Aker, who's written some books on happiness. And Sean Aker had this five, st if you do these five things every day, you'll be happier. And so Randy decided that he was going to try and do those five things every day for 30 days, and he was going to write about it. And it is a, st it is a stunningly good blog. It is really enjoyable. He's a great writer. He's funny. And it's a really heartfelt, touching story about watching somebody deal with their depression day in and day out. And so that show, you know, that, that episode, I really, I really like, and I really like his work. And the five things that he did was, um, that were encouraged was to exercise every day, to meditate every day, to, um, try and do a random act of kindness every day and to write down something you're grateful for, three things you're grateful for, and then also to reflect on something that went good that day um, versus the things that went bad. So, and he, he goes through that, and it's a, really, it's a really great episode. The other one we had recently is a gentleman named Rich Roll, and he is a, his story is recovering alcoholic, um, so he got, he, he, he dealt, he dealt with that battle. And then by the time he was 40, he'd sort of fallen into a slump. He was overweight. He wasn't happy and he transformed his entire life, um, by transforming to a, a, a plant-based diet and he became an ultra athlete and began running, you know, crazy races. But he's a really inspirational story of somebody who just middle age said, you know what? I don't like the direction I'm going. I'm going to change that and, and did it pretty dramatically. Okay. Well, you know, Eric, based on those two examples, this might be self-evident, but if our listeners who are struggling with worry, anxiety, depression, if they were to subscribe to your show, listen to your podcast, what could they expect to get out of them? Well, I, hopefully they will, they will get um, encouragement to, for how, how, to, 
how to handle depression and worry, maybe not in as direct a fashion as, as your podcast, but what we're talking about people with is how do they deal with the negative voices in their head? How do they deal with rejection that they come across in different things? And we're very focused on you know, my goal is I want us to be positive without being Pollyanna-like. You know, we try and be very practical and down to earth about things that work and help people. And and I sort of weave my story in and out of it. And I'm I'm a recovering uh, alcoholic and addict, and I've dealt with depression. And so that stuff sort of works its way through. So hopefully, it's an entertaining and yet enlightening way for for people to to feed their good wolf. That's great, Eric. I, I'm sure it is. I hope our listeners head over to oneufeed.net. Check out the website. If you get a chance to go into the iTunes store and subscribe and write a review, it would really help Eric's cause. And uh, I will put links for this in the show notes. Eric, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, Jay. I appreciate it. I really appreciated Eric coming on the show for that quick interview. And If there are any podcasters out there that feel they're putting together content that would help our audience, people who are looking for resources and tools and success stories of folks who have overcome worry, anxiety, or depression, reach out to us. Head on over to conquerworry.org and let's have a conversation about having you on the show. So with that, I'm going to move on to the interview with Eric Aller where we discuss the book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. On this episode of the Conquer Worry Show, we are going to review what I consider to be the single greatest book ever written on conquering worry. My guest today is Eric Aller. Eric and I met in a professional capacity several months ago, but quickly found that we have two fundamental passions in, in common. The first is a deep passion for the University of Tennessee football program, which is painful at times. And the second is that we both feel that one book helped us change our lives. The book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. Now, Eric is uniquely qualified to come on and discuss this book because not only did it help change his life, but he later went on to become a Dale Carnegie trainer and taught this subject matter to hundreds of people. Eric, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. Sure. We really appreciate your time. You know, to get started, why don't you give our audience a little bit of a background on yourself? All right. Um, I was born and raised in central Kansas. I was a farm kid from Kansas, worked on the farm. Uh, My father was actually a custom harvester, so we cut wheat for other farmers. Uh, We had the equipment, and we'd we'd travel around cutting uh, cutting miles and miles of wheat every summer. And uh, so from the time I was 12 years old, I was driving combine 12 to 16 hours a day all summer long. And I would, the day before school was started, I would go to school. And, and uh, uh, so that in itself taught me a huge work ethic. It's like there is no good job, there's no bad jobs, there's just work that needs to be done. So I think that was, that was one uh, wonderful aspect of that um, beginning in life. Uh, when I decided, uh, when I graduated from high school, I was not, I needed to go out and get a job. So I went out and got a job at a local factory, uh, making mobile homes of all sorts and become a plumber's helper and worked for about a year and a half. Uh, when, where, where I was from, a real small town. I mean, when I say small, it was 400 people. So there was not a lot of folks there. Sure. And uh, anybody that ever went off to college never came back. So in my mind, the only people that went to college were people that were really either really wealthy or very smart. I didn't think I was either one. So I, my lot in life was to go out and get a job. Well, I, I went out and got a job at a factory. Worked really well for a year and a half. Uh, I think I was making 2.35 an hour. A year and a half later, I was making 2.75 cents an hour, uh-huh. and uh, went in for a raise one day and uh, told the guy, "Hey, I hear you're hiring in people, paying them what you're paying me. I'd like a new raise. I'd like a raise." And uh, he said, "Oh, we can't give a raise." And I said, "Think about it and let me let me know tomorrow your true answer." Well, I went back the next day and I said, "How about that raise?" And he said, "Eric, I told you we can't give you a raise." So I said, "Well, fine." I quit. And uh, with no more warning than that, I was unemployed. Uh, I had a little bit of money in my pocket, so I 
I uh, had a friend of mine that had moved to Maryville, Tennessee, just south of Knoxville. And this was a thousand miles away. And I thought, I've got a little money, I've got a little time, let me go visit. So I went out to visit his family that had moved out there. And he had an uncle that had a job, uh, had a, uh, a filling station there. And I got a job at the filling station just for a little gas money. And, uh, and uh, while I was there, one of the guys working there was going to campus and uh, uh, going to the University of Tennessee and, and traveled back and forth every day to the campus. And one day he said, Eric, yeah, come over to the campus. I'm going to a party one night. And I, So I loaded up and went with him. And um, I decided right then, I said, I met all these people. And I said, geez, if these folks can go to school, I, I basically said, if these idiots can go to school, I can go to school. So I, I applied <laughs> for college with no more forewarning than that. Sure. Uh, it was just seemed like a good thing to do. But uh, So, Eric, what it, decade what, was that? This was uh, 1974. Okay. Uh, 1974. So I was uh, uh, I graduated from high school in 71, worked, uh, worked a while. And, um, but I was a little bit overwhelmed and, uh, by all the stress and strains of a new place, new beginnings, uh, studying that I, I, uh, didn't really know how to do that well. And to back it all up, my mother was a child of the depression and she was a champion warrior. My mother worried about everything. She worried that every time I walked out the door that I wasn't coming back. She worried that dad couldn't do anything, you know, uh, because it wasn't, nothing was ever going to turn out right. And she just, it just seemed like that was just the permeating thing in our household was the fact that they just seemed to have to worry about everything, wring your hands over everything and rehash and saw the sawdust of things that had been done a long time ago. So, hey, Eric, um, Eric, let me ask yeah. you a little bit about that. So, when you were growing up and you saw that, did you recognize that as a problem growing up? Or is it something now looking back you could see that your mother was a worrier and that could have been a bit of a challenge? I didn't have any other uh, viewpoints, so it just seemed like that's what you had to do. I mean, mm -hmm. I, my mother did it. My father did it a little bit. So I just thought that's just the way you interacted and with the world. Uh, they wasn't didn't realize until I got out in the world that that's not the way most people acted. Um, so, uh, so I had to overcome that in some way. Um, and one day I'm buying books my freshman year in college, and I'm buying books at the UT bookstore, and I'm walking down there and walking through the books, and I see this book that says, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. And it, it almost, I almost thought it was some kind of a joke book or something because I'd never seen it. It seemed like, yeah, right, how to stop worrying and start living. You know, what's this going to say? And I opened up the book, and I started reading it. And I read the first page, and I read the second, and I'm going, this, this, this seemed to be very interesting. And uh, so I sat down and ended up reading the first two chapters of the book. And I couldn't afford it because I think the book cost $2.35, but I ended up buying the book that day, and I took it home and read it the whole day uh, and half the next. And that day and a half literally changed my life because of the simple rules of thumb that Dale Carnegie presented in his book allowed me to overcome all these years of worrying because I had felt like I was like the ghost of Marley walking through the Christmas Carol, Dickens' Christmas Carol movie, where he was dragging all these things behind him. I said I felt like Marley was walking through the world with all these worries and things that I felt like I had to worry about. And this Literally, the first chapter allowed me to unlock those and drop them on the ground, and I literally have never worried since. Wow. Well, before we talk about the rules of thumb that helped you, tell us a little bit about your career after that experience. Well, um, my, my goal when I started the college was I wanted to finish in four years. I did get a degree in four years um, and uh, was very proud of that. I was the first of 54 first cousins to ever go to college, and um, so that was a little bit of everybody wondered how did that happen. Sure. And um, so I, I went out into the working world and um, got a job in sales. I figured, well, I didn't have a, a degree in engineering, and I wasn't going to be a doctor, so I needed to go into sales. So I went in and got a job in sales, and literally the first job that I applied for, they hired me, and then within a couple of days they came back and they said, your aptitude test said you'll never be a good salesperson. Uh, because, so uh, you're just too empathetic, and uh, so we'll uh, we have to rescind our offer. Wow! And so literally, they they fired me after two days on the job. So I went to work for another company, my second choice that I had, and 
literally in four years, they had 1,500 salespeople. I became in the top five in the company out of 1,500 salespeople. And I think that maybe that job, maybe like Peyton Manning not winning the Heisman Trophy, you know, them telling me I was never going to be a good salesperson, it was something in the back of my mind said, I'll show you. Yep, um, yep. So, so I did that for, uh, for several years right out of college. And then every time I would have a good year, that company would cut my territory in half. And I'd have a good year the next year, and they'd cut my territory in half. And I said, what in the world is going on here? And they said, Eric, you're making too much money. And I, I said, well, I thought that was the idea, um, you know, that if you work hard, you got rewarded for your benefits, but they just seemed to think, take away your client base. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I literally went in. I, I had to make a decision. And um, one of the ways that I've always made decisions, I look into the future 20 years from now and say, in 20 years, what am I going to be looking back and wish I'd have done? And I'd always had an interest in, in stocks and finance, so I became a financial advisor. And, uh, and so I've been doing that for over 25 years now. And now I'm, I've been well-established. I, uh, I manage a lot of money for a lot of people in an industry that is pretty well um, considered to be kind of a, a boiler pressure type work uh, where you have uh, – um, you got a lot of stress and strain on you on a day-to-day basis and major decisions. But because of the principles that I learned, I've literally never worried about that. Uh, I make good decisions, put, the, put people's uh, assets to work in the way that I know they need to be, and I, I never worry about it from that point. Great. Great. Well, let's talk about some of those rules then that allowed you to get from that bookstore in the 1970s at the University of Tennessee's campus to where you are today. All right. Um, well, as I said, when I read the first chapter, I was hung on the book because the first chapter in the book, he, he has an interesting title. It says, Live in Daytight Compartments. And uh, like I said, I was, I was like Marty's ghost walking through time with, with every mistake I'd ever made dragging behind me and worrying about how that was going to affect my future. And basically, the, the Dale Carnegie in his book went out and interviewed very successful people. Uh, the book was written um, – over 75 years ago, but Dale Carnegie went out and interviewed people all over the country, he interviewed the most successful people, and he asked him to tell him stories about what they had overcome to be the success that, that they all were at that time. And uh, so these principles apply to anybody, but this one gentleman said he was worrying himself into a grave, and he went on a cruise, uh, and uh, he, he asked the, the captain, what happens if something's on a leak. He was worried about the boat sinking. And he says, well, we have these compartments. We have what we call daytight compartments, that if there's a leak in one compartment, we can close it off from the other parts of the ship so that that, that leak doesn't get into the rest of the ship and sink the ship. And he came up with that philosophy of he needed to live in daytight compartments. And that is live today, live the best day you can live today, prepare today as much as you can, and don't worry about what happened yesterday because that's a closed door. There's water behind that door, but you don't have to worry about it because it's blocked off. Worry about today, take care of today, and move towards the future, and everything will always work out well. So that was that was the number one rule that uh, that probably changed my life more than anything. So from now on, um, I don't stew about the future. I just live basically each day until bedtime and uh, try to do the best I can. And it doesn't mean I'm not preparing for tomorrow. Because one of the, the top brokers in the business one time told me, he said, Eric, don't ever go home at night until you know exactly what you're going to be doing tomorrow. So I can prepare for tomorrow, but don't worry about it. Just prepare for it, and uh, then tomorrow you work as hard as you can and then prepare for the next day. It's amazing how that simple philosophy changed my entire life and allowed me to quit worrying about things and be more productive. So, okay. so the first uh, idea is to live in daytight compartments, let the past be the past, and then worry about tomorrow when tomorrow gets here. Is that fair? That's exactly right. Uh, focus on the, focus on the, the now, and even you know Jesus mentions that in the Bible. You know, live not for tomorrow, live for today. Um, but uh, so another another thing that they talk about a lot is, you know. If you have a real serious problem, a lot of people will make a problem bigger than it is by just talking about it, worrying about it, stewing about it. And uh, Dale Kearney pointed out a, uh, a process of dealing with that, that problem solving and making it manageable. And what he said was, he said, ask yourself about any problem, 
okay, what's the worst po- that can possibly happen if I can't solve this problem? You know, what's the worst possible thing? And you say, well, if I can't fix this problem, worst possible thing that could happen is if it really went to heck in hand basket, I'd get fired. Uh, okay, so that's the worst. Okay, then you accept that that situation that, okay, that's the worst that's going to happen. Well, that isn't that bad. I was looking for a job and I found this one. I think I can go out and get a job in virtually any firm in town now um, because I've been doing this for so long. So basically I, you prepare yourself to accept that worst if that happens and then basically start working on seeing how you can improve that. Say, okay, how can I do it? And it almost makes problems disappear. It almost shrinks everything down to a manageable level so that when you can just deal with it and quit making it uh, bigger than it is. So rule number two, ask yourself what's the worst that can possibly happen if you can't solve a problem, and then prepare yourself mentally to accept that and then just uh, calmly try to improve upon that. Would you say using that particular process would allow you to accept a the worst possible outcome and maybe sometimes realize that the worst possible outcome is actually not as bad as you thought it was? That's what usually happens when you really boil it down and you say, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Well, you know, you might, you know, you, uh, you know, it's, it's usually the consequences are fairly small and, uh, you know, statistics always show, I mean, it's like 99% of the things we worry about never happen. Most people just right. worry about the was it. And I know, I know less than that happened to my, the things my mother worried about because she worried about everything. Um, so I think the key thing is keep yourself focused on today. Uh, don't, don't worry about those things that are happening. Just deal with them one at a time, and they'll all take care of themselves. Okay. Good. Good. Do you have another idea? Well, uh, in, in light of my uh, business that I do, um, and that is how do, I, how do I make decisions? You know, how do I pr- prepare myself to go to somebody and say, I want you to, I want you to trust me with your life savings here? And uh, one, of the, one of the topics in the book that basically, and again, I studied this thing. I have read this book over and over again. When I was teaching Dale Carnegie classes on a regular basis, I would literally listen to both Dale Carnegie books before I taught the class. I have it on CD, and and I always have one of them in my car at all times, and I'm driving down, I get tired of listening to music uh, on the radio, I'll pop in the El Carnegie book or one or the other. So I've listened to these things dozens and dozens of times. But one of the topics that I felt, or one of the nutshells that he comes up and, and, and how to analyze worry is, is basically how do you come up with the, uh, to make proper decisions and basically, he said, after carefully weighing all the facts, come to a solution. He said, half the worry in the world is caused by people trying to make decisions before they have sufficient knowledge on which to base a decision. So basically what he's saying is do all your research, study as best you can, and make the best decision that you possibly can based on the information you have at that time. And that's all you can do. So when I, if you were to come to me and say, hey, help me, help me plan my kids' re- to college plan, we'd look at today's today's uh, investments, we look at, at how old the child is, we look at all the facts, and we say, okay, based on that, if I were you, here's what I would do, and I literally do that, and for some reason, it, it just seems to work out, and uh, it works out over the long haul, and um, um, yeah. and I don't, I don't worry about it. I don't have any anxiety over decisions that I made yesterday because I know I went and did the right thing at the right time for the right reason. It seems to me that the study part of it could really help validate that process for somebody. For example, let's say you were looking, you're in a, a job that you didn't care for, you wanted to make a move, and maybe you could help yourself if you were worried about making a bad decision by spending extra time taking that first step, studying all the different options out there for you, and getting yourself into a place to make that decision. You think that would help you eliminate some of that worry? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that I did exactly that this weekend. My son-in-law just changed jobs. He went from one law firm to another law firm, uh, and and we we had this talk about the fact that it sounds like uh, you're you're interested in going. Do all the research you can on the new firm. Find out everything you can find out about them, and make a list of all the advantages of going with that new firm, and then make a list of all the things that would be advantages of staying with your firm. Well, the advantages of why he should leave far outweighed the disadvantages of staying. So 
his decision was made by the facts. So basically, figure out what's the problem, you know, uh, you know, what are the possible solution, and and list list them out, and then move with your actions. Don't worry about it anymore. Dismiss all anxiety and just move ahead. Yeah, I like it. So. All right. Any other ideas that have really helped you shape your path since the 1970s? Well, I'm, um, I'll probably never retire because I'm one of these people that I go crazy on a three-day weekend. I have to be doing something. And uh, like Grandma always said, uh, idle hands are a devil's workshop. So I, I take that very seriously because I've got to be doing something. So I've, I've taken up a good hobby, and I recommend that for anybody. Any professional needs to have something other than his job because I see too many doctors that have committed – so many hours a day into their jobs, and then they retire, and they have nothing to pull back on. They have their, so it's kind of like they're kind of lost. I was like, well, I can help take care of the grandchildren, or I can do some uh, some civic work. But I, my hobby is uh, I've got several, as a matter of fact. But I, I love doing woodworking, and uh, and specifically, I love doing wood carving. So to me, wood carving is my my therapy. It's my meditation uh, uh, when I. Get a piece of, and it's a fairly inexpensive hobby. I mean, and you can do it. Anybody can learn how to carve. Uh, if you just learn about four or five cuts, you get a good sharp knife and the right kind of wood. And there are classes that can do that. But I, um, I've carved dozens and dozens of figurines, um, Tennessee hound dogs, Santa Clauses, mountain men, clowns, uh, snowmen, Santa Clauses, um, and they're in high demand. But I, I can't make these fast enough to. to produce for sale. So uh, basically all of them that I've ever made are still in the family. But uh, uh, to me, that is that is a strong um, or something that, that people really need to focus on. Because if I go to carving for an hour, uh, I sometimes I'll be carving along, have no idea what time it is. Sometimes I don't even know what day it is. I mean, I've been carving and it's like, it's like it puts me in a trance. I'm so focused on what I'm doing. And uh, so exercise and and carving or focusing on something outside of your day-to-day worries will kind of make all those worries go away. I can go to work the next day, and it's, it's like I've flushed my system of anything um, that's stuck up in there. Well, you know, we've talked about the importance of exercise on previous episodes of the Conquer Worry Show and the benefits to anybody struggling with worry. But i got to tell you, having a hobby really helped me get out of my bad place. But I do know that somebody who is – struggling with anxiety or depression, it's very hard to take those first steps to get back in and find a hobby that you might like or re-engage with something that you used to enjoy. But forcing yourself to do it really does provide for a fantastic escape. And it sounds like you've been able to make that a a lifelong objective for you to help eliminate some of the worry. We have a carving club in Birmingham, and uh, we've we've got several people in there that are in their late 80s and even 90 years years old that still enjoy carving. Um, they they and they're masters at it, and they enjoy the training of the young people that are coming in. So uh, it's available out there. All you have to do is go out and search it out and find it. Find a hobby that you like: photography, woodworking, wood turning. There's all kinds of clubs that you can join. That they have classes. Uh, one or two Saturdays a month uh, where they'll teach you this stuff. They want you to be involved. And again, for wood carving, $100 worth of wood and $100 worth of knives, and I'm pretty much good for about five years, literally. It's, uh, all i got to do is keep my knives sharp, and uh, <clears throat> I, can, I can carve for years on the wood that I've already got stored up. That's great. That really is. Well, do you have any other thoughts for our listeners about the book and any ideas in there that you think might be pertinent? Well, um, one of the things that they they dwell upon in the book is keep layering in good thoughts in your mind, whether that be reading your Bible, reading uh, good works, reading motivational speakers. Um, And and I'll skip away from Dale Carnegie and one of his uh, uh, people that was was also inspired by Dale Carnegie, Zig Ziglar. One of my favorite pieces from Zig Ziglar was about a – uh, a mall in Tennessee that he used to drive by, and he said when he, he used to drive past this landfill that was going on there, and, and there was a landfill that, that there was 
uh, seagulls flying over, and there was just a, a depression there, and they just kept hauling in garbage there for years. He went by there, and then one day he comes by there, and it's leveled off and flat. And then the next time he comes up there, they're building this really nice, expensive mall there. And he talked to somebody, and they said, yeah, he said, you know, how, how did this land become such valuable land? And he said, well, you know, he said, we put this garbage in there for years. We just packed it down. We started layering on this good topsoil on top of it and packing it in, packing it in. And we just kept doing that until we had an un, a really solid base of something, and we built this mall on here. So this piece of property went from basically lowland swampland to very valuable property. And he said, your mind is a lot like that. And, and, and I related that directly to me because I had had junk filled into my head all my life by people that outside that had maybe good meanings, my, my mother, uh, meaning, meaning well, but, but making me worry and, and teaching me bad habits. So what I started doing is I layered in Dale Carnegie. I layered in Zig Ziglar. I Dale Dennis Waitley and, and all the good public speakers, these books on CD that you can go to any library and check out. And I listen to them constantly over and over. I can repeat paragraphs out of these things now because I've listened to them so long. But that, to me, is the best thing for keeping the long-term mental health well is is – Focus on the positive. Continuously focus on the good things in life, and it's amazing how much different your attitude is. And you don't one, you don't worry about things. And if you get your mind filled up with peace, courage, and health, and and uh, and the future, it's it's hard to worry about the uh, the, the bad things in life. So, um, and I'd always tell people turn off the news uh, because you know when you watch the news, they always show the pictures of the burning houses, but they don't ever show you any pictures of any houses being built. And for every one that burns down, there's a hundred being built someplace. And uh, so you really have to understand the news is really there to, to tell you about all the bad things in life. I say, hey, go out and live your life. Let the newscasters live theirs and go out and enjoy your life. Get away from the news and um, quit worrying. Go out and live your life. Get involved. As you said, keep, keep in good exercise, keep in good shape, stay healthy, and, and uh, life is well worth living. Yep. Yep, that's right. And I tell you, for those struggling with worry and anxiety and, and depression and really any mental illness, keeping a positive mental attitude is, quite frankly, one of the hardest things to do. And all the names that you mentioned have put together great works. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of books out there that can give you ideas. And if you just go out and start reading some of the better known authors and find some that speak to you, you'll be amazed on what you latch on to and how they could really help motivate you to help get yourself better. One of the old sayings is the fact that when the pupil is ready, the teacher will arrive. And for some reason, on that day in 1974, when I picked up the book, I was ready for Dale Carnegie. So that spoke to me. So that's probably sh stuck with me greater than anything else. And um, But like you said, there's thousands of these uh, uh, books out there that people can read. Go out and find them. Find that one that's that you're ready for, and uh, it could change your life. Yep. And I tell you, when I first read the book in college, there's a story in here about a gentleman named Earl Haney. And Earl was a New Yorker who had worried himself sick to the point where he had ulcers to the extent the doctors told him he wasn't going to live. I believe it was maybe three, six more months. So he said, all right, well, if I'm going to die anyway, I'm going to go out to the West Coast. I'm going to get on a boat, and I'm going to sail to India. I can't remember where he was trying to get passage to. He gets on the boat, brings a bunch of booze and cigars, and has a big old time. He gets to where he he's going. His, he took his casket with him. He took, that's right. He took his casket with him because the captain wouldn't let him on the boat unless he brought his casket, right? That's right. <laughs> and then, you know, he gets to his destination, and he's perfectly fine because he started focusing on the positive. He quit worrying about all of his troubles that were giving him those ulcers, and he went on to live for years after that. Absolutely. That was a, that was a great story, a classic Dale Carnegie story. And, and they're all true. Uh, like I said, I have talked to many people that were involved in the Dale Carnegie class. And you mentioned that I became an instructor for the Dale Carnegie class for, for many years. I literally, the first, my first job in co after college, I started um, 
I, I went to my employer, the sales company, and I said, I want to take the Dale Carnegie class. Well, they was happy to pay for it. So I, I took the Dale Carnegie class, and then I loved it so much because of my, my interest in Dale Carnegie that I, I became a graduate assistant and, and participated in over 25 classes just helping out for free just so I could keep measure, keep soaking that stuff in. And, um, and then one day the, the local Dale Carnegie man said, hey, you you do this stuff as well as my instructors. Why don't you become an instructor? So I went through the process to become an instructor for several years. So um, it's like find something you love, throw yourself into it, and the rewards are out there. For somebody who's out there struggling today and has a Dale Carnegie resource in their area, what could they expect if they went and engaged in one of their programs? And, and specifically, how it could potentially help them get out of whatever mental state they're in? I would think it's an excellent uh, thing for people to think about because it, it, it covers both the books. Um, it's, I've seen people's lives literally change by going through the books. Uh, then I've seen people that go through it and they go, they go kind of ho-hum because they didn't put a whole lot into it. Uh, one of my pupils that, was, that I use as an example a lot was a young man who was a computer programmer in Huntsville, 90 miles away. And he paid for the class with his own money and drove, left work and drove like crazy every, every once, a night, once a week for 12 weeks down to Birmingham to take the class because it wasn't offered in Huntsville at that time. And that man blew away everybody else in the class by the growth that he experienced in there. He went from an introverted computer programmer to one of the best spokesmen in the class over that time, over that 12 week time period, because he put a lot into it. So I would say if they went into the Dale Carnegie class, read the books either before or while you're taking the class and put everything you can into it, do every exercise and really go out and do what they ask you to do because they give you these, these, challenges every week and they say go out in and, and approach people in this manner go out and go out and learn how to do this go out and go out and and meet as many people as you can and uh, learn to project yourself and then you come back the next week and you give a report on that well again do the best you can to prepare for that and i guarantee you that class will change your life i have students that still call me and email me that took my class years ago um because we have a bond together. I literally saw them go from somebody who's, and literally I saw people's knees knocking. One young man was going through, going to be a CPA, and his his knees literally knocked together when he was talking. I never saw that. I thought that was a cartoon, but I actually saw that happening. <laughs> and uh, but he went, he he, and when he graduated from the CPA, he he ended up being the person that gave the speech for the CPA class. So he was um, life was changed from that moment on. So. Again, reach out, grab the challenge, run with it as hard as you can, and the Dale Carnegie class will change your life. Excellent. Well, Eric, listen, you've been very kind with your time here tonight. Do you you have any last thoughts for the listeners before we wrap this episode? Um, Just I would love to be an example for anybody in the fact that you can overcome this because if I hadn't have overcome the, the worry that, that it had been instilled in my life by people beyond my control, uh, who knows what I would be at this time. Um, so I say reach out, grab life. It's well worth living. It's just your attitude that's holding you back. And uh, um, conquer the worry as quickly as you can and move on with life. Have a positive attitude. So my approach is... Uh, do it now. Don't wait for later, because life is life. Uh, life is really short. Everything you everything you really appreciate in life is free. That's your family, your health. Uh, so protect it by uh, by having good relationships with your family. Quit worrying about things. Keep your health good, and uh, enjoy the enjoy every minute of it. That's great, Eric. I, listen, I want our listeners to understand that Eric wasn't paid to come on to the Conquer Worry show here to talk about this book. And he runs a very big business down in Birmingham. So to take up his time to come and talk about this, I I really can't thank you enough for it, Eric. I know that you, as a result of your time and experience that you shared here today, we're going to help some people. So thank you very much for coming on the Conquer Worry show. Thank you, Jay. It's been a pleasure. So Chris, what'd you think of that interview? I could tell that he was very passionate about 
the book and that it clearly has affected his life as much as it has affected ours. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, we still give that book out to this day. When I was in his office a couple months ago, he showed me some CDs to where he would give people out an audio version of the book just to make sure that they were getting some of the tools and resources that were in that piece of work for them. So we really appreciate Eric coming on the show. We appreciate Eric Zimmer as well for coming on to talk a little bit about his podcast. All the information from this show can be found on our website, conquerworry.org. You'll find the links in the show notes, and please help us out. If you're listening to us on iTunes, please go to the iTunes store and rate us. It helps us a lot more than you could possibly imagine. And lastly, if you would like to volunteer and help Conquer Worry create awareness of all the resources that are available, please head on over to our website at conquerworry.org and send us a message. We sure could use your help anywhere in the world. And please remember, whatever you're doing in life, live in relentless pursuit of your life's purpose. 